and show uh, display that we put on for you. <laughs> uh, uh, we're very fortunate today to uh, tonight to be uh, to be uh, joined by uh, Andrew Howard, who's come down to us from UC Berkeley, uh, and uh, he's going to give us uh, a talk on exoplanets tonight. Uh, Andrew got his uh, Bachelor of, uh, of Science in Physics at MIT. Uh, and then completed his PhD at Harvard uh, with Paul Horowitz, uh, and he was working on optical SETI at that stage. Uh, he came across to Berkeley uh, to work with Jeff Marcy and uh, switched fields to exoplanets, uh, and he's had a lot more success finding his, the object of his desire in, in exoplanets. He's been working with the California Planet Survey and the uh, NASA UC ETA Earth program, and he's particularly interested in the distribution of exoplanets uh, and what we're now starting to find out from uh, Kepler and uh, the surveys that uh, Andrew is, is working with. So I think it's going to be a very interesting talk. And if you'll all join me in welcoming Andrew. Everyone hear me? Good. Um, let me get started first by getting a sense of the audience. Um, Adrian uh, tried to convince me that this audience would be split 50-50 with people who work sort of here or at Ames and, and sort of the general public. So um, a show of hands if you are a professional scientist or engineer. Okay, a show of hands if you're uh, a member of the general public. <laughs> show of hands if someone coerced you to be here. Okay. <laughs> you can leave at any time. Um, all right, well, I'd like to keep this talk informal, so please feel free to ask questions during the middle of the talk. Um, my slides are sort of a hybrid of a public talk I give on exoplanets um, that might be geared more towards the lay audience, and then also some technical talks that I give um, to experts. So I'll be speaking kind of on two levels, so if there's some confusion, please don't hesitate to, um, to, ask, to, uh, to ask any questions. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I am especially interested in understanding if the solar system depicted up there is like most of the solar systems out in the universe. The solar system depicted there, of course, is our own, and it has several salient properties. Um, the first is that all of the small planets are on the inside. By the way, this plot is the planets are to scale, but their distances are not, obviously. It be a little tight. Um, this, this plot shows that the small planets are all inside of Jupiter's orbit, and outside of that we have large gassy objects. This, our solar system, the planets orbit in circular orbits, more or less, um, whereas in some of the extrasolar planets we're seeing, they, look, they orbit in what we call eccentric orbits, more elongated orbits, more like uh, comets orbits. So, so one of the key goals of my research, and actually a, a huge field of research, is to understand, to place our solar system in the context of all the extrasolar planetary systems out there. So these are the key questions that um, we'll touch on tonight, and that, uh, that hopefully we'll continue to build on over the next many years. How is our solar system made? How common are the big planets like Jupiter, and how common are the small rocky ones like the Earth? And also, what's the, what's the diversity of solar systems? Are we an oddball, or is our solar system common? The tools that we use to address this question, at least the ones I'll be talking about tonight, are Doppler planet searches. This is the radio velocity method. This is what I do uh, most of the time in my day job. Uh, and then also transiting planet surveys, of which Kepler is um, by far the most spectacular example. And my talk will be divided into spending most of my time, well, maybe the first two-thirds on these Doppler planet searches, what we're learning from them, how they work, uh, and so forth, and then the last third on transiting planet searches. Okay, how do you find a planet? One way that you might imagine you could find a planet is to just to look for them with a very powerful telescope and an excellent 
imager. There's a problem, though, which is that stars are, are relatively bright, and the planets are really dim. This is approximately the scale. If you want to take a picture of a planet, it's like taking a picture of a lit match when you're looking at a, at a, at a lighthouse. And it's even harder than that because the lighthouse is in Hawaii and we're in California. <laughs> so from our perspective, the two are right on top of each other and their relative brightness is just so extreme that it's very difficult to, to actually take a picture. There have actually been a few pictures of extrasolar planets taken. And in these cases, they're kind of, uh, so far, they're um, special cases where either you can make the match much brighter or you can move the two apart so that it's easier to resolve them. That's a really hard problem. Here's a slightly easier one. Let's not look for the light from the planet itself, but let's look for its, the, the effect of the planet on its host star. The, one of the effects that a planet can have on a star is that it tugs on it gravitationally. And this little animation shows how, uh, as a planet orbits a star, the star also orbits the common center of mass of these two objects. And so the, uh, the, the star wobbles. This wobble motion causes the light that we receive from the planet to be Doppler shifted. When the star is coming towards us, the light is shifted slightly towards the blue. The, the entire spectrum becomes a little bluer. And when it's receding, the planet, uh, the star uh, spectrum becomes slightly redder. So all of the information about the orbit of the planet, the size of the planet, that, that is its mass, um, the orbital period, how often it goes around its star, the eccentricity of this orbit, is all encoded in the details of the light that comes, that's Doppler shifted uh, from the star. This is a pretty famous method and became uh, really famous in 1995. I wanted to show the one of the first, I guess we call real um, planets. This is Michel Mayor, Didier Kilo, and this is the, the planet 51 Peg. And this is their data. We're going to be looking at a few plots like this tonight, so I just wanted to ground you a little bit. What, they, what they've done is that they make measurements of the velocity of the star, that is, whether the star is coming towards you or whether it's moving away from you. And they make them over the course of many nights. And they find that over the course of, in this case, about four nights, this star's velocity undergoes a little an oscillation. It goes up, it comes down, it goes up again, it comes down. And you come back a, f a few months later, it does the same thing. If you phase all of those up, that is, put all these plots on top of each other with the orbital period of the planet, you can see that there's a very nice curve representing the velocity of this um, star, which is what we actually <coughs> measure, um, which reveals the presence of a planet. Okay, that's, that's lesson number one on Doppler searches. So I'm going to now talk about the transit method. This is the method employed very successfully by the Kepler Space Telescope. This, this method also is an indirect method in the sense we don't see the planet itself. We look only at the host star. And in Ke the case of Kepler, Kepler stares at a patch of sky um, up in, near the Summer Triangle in Cygnus and Lyra, where there are 150,000 stars. And for each star, it very carefully measures the brightness of the star. And it measures it uh, as a function of time. And when a planet passes in front of the star, the amount of light that is received by the Kepler telescope decreases a little bit. In fact, the amount that it decreases is just the area of this uh, of that planet. And then when the planet finishes transiting the host star, the, the brightness of the star returns back to its normal level. So this measurement of brightness versus time also encodes a lot of information about the properties of the planets. How often it repeats tells you the orbital period of the planet. The amount, the depth of this so-called transit or eclipse tells you how big the planet is compared to the star. So we can get the radii of planets from this method. Can you ask a yeah. When, uh, when it's transiting up or high up or down below the sun, does it uh, look different measurements? There, so one thing you can imagine is that if, if the transit happens, say, just right up here, it'll be a little bit shorter because the cord across the star is a little bit shorter there. So the duration is shorter. The other thing is if it happens, if it just sort of kisses the edge there, it'll be a, the shape will be a little bit different. It'll be kind of V-shaped and it might be slightly shallower. But you'll be able to catch it. You can usually figure that out. You can you make a, a complicated model involving how the star gets slightly dimmer on the edges and, 
and it, um, you can usually figure out what's going on. How do you differentiate between star spots? Um, <clears throat> star spots look at, well, for one thing, star spots have a different time scale. So star spots are fixed on the surface of a star, and they rotate with the star. So a star typically takes, you know, a week or two, sometimes a month, to rotate. Um, so the time scale for this to happen is pretty long. These brief dips are on the time scale of hours. <coughs> the Earth passing across the disk of the Sun takes 12 hours. Most of the planets that Kepler find takes make much, are much shorter than that. Yeah? On your earlier, where you were talking about the Doppler shift, you said you looked at it for three or four days, but the sun, that, that sun moving forward and backwards seemed to be the period of the orbit of the planet, so that may be a year. How can you measure a shift in a couple of days? That particular planet, 51 Peg, one thing that made it extraordinary and really paradigm changing was that the orbital period of the planet is only four days. Oh, okay. So the star and the planet, they go, they're in this locked dance, like two figure skaters. And so the period of the, that you see in the star is the same as in the planet. And it was amazing that a Jupiter-sized planet could be found at a, in a four-day orbit. How much of a wavelength shift did the planet make to the star's uh, light? And Very, that, the question was how much of a wavelength shift was there, and I have an animation to answer your question in a few slides. <laughs> Anything else? I'm glad there are questions, by the way. Yeah? Uh, the trace here is a little jaggedy, but I'm wondering if Kepler is sensitive enough that if a uh, giant gas planet goes across, can you actually see Earth-sized moons around the gas planet? <laughs> <laughs> the question was whether or not you could see a moon on these giant gas balls. Um, people have thought about this, and the, the technique to find moons is actually a little bit different. And the, the way that people think we might be able to find moons has to do with timing. <laughs> these transits, you could imagine that a planet, as it orbits its of stars, like a very precise clock that always comes around at exactly one orbital period later. But if there's a moon orbiting the planet, that will slow down the, the planet a little bit when the moon is on, say, one side of the planet versus the other, and cause the eclipse to happen a little bit earlier or a little bit late. And to my knowledge, there haven't been any discoveries by this technique yet, but people are looking really hard see if they can find a moon. Other questions? What, what percentage of the brightness of the moon is normally diminished by the planet? It looks like it would be very, very small. It's really hard. Um, a Jupiter-sized planet blocks 1% of a star like the sun. And the Earth blocks a part in 10,000. So you have to, the people sitting in the second row, um, who work on the Kepler team have to have to do extraordinary um, feats of, uh, of precise analysis to produce data that allow you to see these very very small diminutions of light. Is there a natural variation in the brightness of the star even aside from from the planets that you need to somehow factor into that? So the question was on whether or not there's natural variations in the light and the, the brightness of the star, and of course there is. There's star spots. Um, there's various other astrophysical things going on, but the good thing is that there's, we don't know of any processes that would mimic this exact signature. So I think we can, we can um, rule out all those other background problems. Um, one little technical side comment is that the way that you can be fooled in this game, and there's a lot of effort to check for this, is that if you have a um, you're looking at one particular star, and just by chance, in the background, there's two other stars that orbit each other. And those stars happen to eclipse each other. So it's called an eclipsing binary. Then you have a situation where you're looking at one star, and in the background, there's this, there's this um, light that's kind of going up and down, and it's producing eclipses that look like that, except they're much deeper. But because there's the foreground star, it's diluting it so that it looks like this planet transit. But there's some other ways you can figure out that that's not the case. Anyway, that's a, a little bit of a technical side. Okay? All right. How do planets form? This is one of the key goals of exoplanet research. 
The basic picture is that planets form during the process by which stars form. And stars form when gas and dust reach a certain density and uh, coalesce and the, uh, the spinning of this gas and dust causes it uh, a bunch of this dust to settle into a disk. You can see the beginning of this disk forming here. Here's the protostar, an early star forming, and there's this disk of material out of which there are hot spots. These are early planets that are forming. And as we, if we look on a microscopic scale, in this disk of material, there will be grains of dust. As they're drawn near, it's about one micron in size. And these grains of dust, they're kind of like, they're almost like dust bunnies. They end up, they stick together, and there's ice, and they uh, uh, causes the, these bodies to grow and get larger and larger. And there's a lot of, a lot of research encapsulated in this plot. People don't know how you go from a one micron size object and have it grow to be something that's the size of a mountain. But nevertheless, planets are made, so it happens somehow. Um, and there's another huge leap going to a body that's about the size of the Earth. We don't know all the details of how that works, but it seems to be that, it, that it's combining many, many dust particles and ice. And eventually, when you get to be the size a little bit bigger than the Earth, you sweep up all of the gas in the surrounding area, these protoplanets do. They're like vacuum cleaners. And the planets um, go from the size of just a few times the size of the Earth and quickly balloon in size to be Saturn's and Jupiter's by sweeping up all this gas. Quickly meaning? Quickly meaning um, uh, a year, a year. Ten, a hundred thousand years, maybe a million years. Mm -hmm. this, this whole process by which the, from the star forming to having the complete architecture of the system takes about 10 million years. So it's fast compared to that. So here's a technical plot showing uh, some computer simulations of this process. And in these simulations, the, um, this guy, Christoph Mortesini and his collaborators, simulated the growth of planets. And they started out, they, they seeded planets at different distances from the host star, as is shown on this horizontal axis. And they allowed the planets to grow, that is to accumulate material and to migrate. And these planets, the different colors show different phases of their, these planets' um, growth histories. And the very interesting thing is that most of the planets seem to be born in this region out here, out past what's called the ice line. The ice line is the, the magical line in the solar system beyond which ice freezes. And the ice acts as sort of the glue that holds together these dust particles and facilitates the formation of planets. So most planets are born out here. In their simulations, some of them grow up to be very massive to be Jupiter size. Some of them shoot in close to the host star and are, say, Neptune or Uranus size. Um, but the curious feature is that their theory predicts very few planets in this region here. And they actually gave this thing a name. They called it the planet desert. They predicted that there'd be very few planets between the size of, say, one and 10 Earths inside of one AU, which is our Earth's orbital distance. So that was kind of a bold prediction. Um, Here's another prediction from another group uh, by Shigeru Ida and Doug Lin predicting the same thing. And again, this is this desert of close-in planets that was predicted by theorists. So let's go find some plants and let's see if these predictions were right. One of the programs that I worked on is called the NASA ADA sub, uh, UC ADA sub Earth Survey. And this is a radio velocity search for planets orbiting other stars, and we selected basically the nearest and brightest stars, and did as good of a Doppler search around them as we could. The, oops, wrong button. The, the stars are primarily G and K stars. These are stars more or less like the sun. We also have some cooler M stars in our survey, but the results I'm going to talk about don't include those. We observed these stars using the Keck telescope in Hawaii. These are the twin Keck telescopes on the summit of Mauna Kea. We use the Keck 1 telescope. I think it's the one on the left, but I'm not actually sure because um, for better or worse now, we don't go to Hawaii anymore. We do, we do all this by remote control from the basement of the <laughs> astronomy building at UC Berkeley. We have a video conferencing system set up and you know it's like mission control with a bunch of computers. And um, it's nice for having dinner with my wife and kids and then going in and staying up all night and finding planets. 
but it's not so good if you want to go to Hawaii often. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we use we use the Keck telescope, and we measure the spectra of stars. This is the spectrum of our sun, and this is a funny kind of spectrum. It's sort of the, the spectrum of the sun is is like a is on a ribbon here that's wrapped. So in the the red part of the spectrum goes here. You read the spectrum along this way, and when you get to this end, it's simply wrapped to the other side. And it, it goes all the way down through the blue and into the ultraviolet. And each one of these, these little dark lines here is corresponds to some atom or molecule in the atmosphere of our sun, and also in other stars, that absorbs light at a very specific wavelength. And when we measure the Doppler shift of the, of the star, has to do with the planet orbiting around it, we're measuring the movement of these lines as they become slightly bluer, slightly redder, slightly bluer. This motion is very um, slight, and here's an animation which will show you just how slight. It's going to zoom in on one, one line, and then we're zooming in on the CCD pixels, and you can see the, um, that the line moves back and forth, and these are the animators' attempt to show how the CCD pixels go up and down as these lines move back and forth. This is actually exaggerated by several hundred times what the actual effect is. <laughs> um, someone asked earlier how big of an effect this is. We typically, uh, we want to achieve a precision of about one meter per second. So we're, we can tell the speed of the star to about the speed that I'm walking right now. So it's a very precise measurement. And that level of precision corresponds to measuring the location of this spectral line to about one millipixel. It's actually about half that. And that's a displacement on the CCD of about 80 silicon atoms. <laughs> so this is one of these mind-boggling um, numbers. The way we achieve this is by controlling the environment of this instrument very well and using the extraordinarily rich information in this stellar spectrum and averaging over all of the, all of the lines. Most of the stars that we look at with this technique are boring. And they're boring in the sense that they have the radio velocity data that looks like this, and you, you probably don't see anything, any pattern in this data, and I would agree with you. This are radio velocity measurements, that's on the vertical axis, this is how, how much the star is moving towards us or away from us as a function of time, and this is a, over about six years here. And most of these, these curves are just completely flat, and there's, there's a, we, to our limits, we don't see any planets in them. Some of the planet, some of the stars that we look at are more interesting. This is an example of a star um, that has a phone book name 156668. And you can see that there's a couple things going on. One is that this is the velocity again on the vertical axis as a function of time. It goes down and then it comes up, and it goes down again and it comes up. And we're not quite sure what that is. It might be a planet in a couple year long orbit. If it, if it is a if that signal does represent a planet, it's about a Neptune-sized planet in, a, in an orbit equivalent to an asteroid belt in our solar system. But uh, we're going to subtract out that signal. And if we subtract out that signal, this what's left here looks basically like noise. But if you put on your Fourier glasses, which is that you look, um, which is to say that you look for periodic signals in this data stream, and you have to do this with a computer, not with your own eyes. That's what this diagram down here shows, that there's a whopping signal at about four days. And then this is an artifact of the data. And this whopping signal here corresponds to a planet which is zipping up and down very rapidly, causing the radio velocity of the star to move. Unfortunately, the, the scale is such that it's very hard to actually see on this data, so we have to phase up this plot. and uh, wrap the plot that I just showed you on the orbital period of the planet. And when you do this, you can see that clearly the, the velocity of the star goes up and it comes down on a very regular um, period. This is a hard business, especially when the, the sizes of the planets are very small. This particular planet has a mass of only four times the mass of the Earth. And again, it's in a very close in orbit of about four days. We would be very fortuitous if this planet happened to be a line so that it also passes in front of its host star from our perspective. You could imagine that the planets 
orbital plane could be face on or it could be sort of anywhere in between. And if it's just right so that from our perspective the planet passes in front of the star, then we can learn a, a huge amount of extra information about the star from the transit method. So this plot, this little diagram shows how big uh, planets of different compositions are compared to their host star. It's still a pretty hard game. This is the sun for comparison. This is what a planet's disk would look like if it was passing in front of the star. So we, we look for these transiting signals, and I'll show you our data, it's right here. Thus far, we, we don't think that this particular planet is aligned so that it passes in front of its host star, but at least from our perspective, but uh, we're still trying to figure that out. This program went on for several years, and there's sort of a, we have a, developed now a little family tree of the planets that have been discovered. These are the planets from the Eidos of Earth survey. You can see that they have masses. If you have your glasses on, four Earth masses, nine times the mass of the Earth, 22, eight. Most of these are pretty close in orbits. But these are small planets, and we're finding a lot of small planets, which is one of the, the take home messages from my talk. I'm going to go quickly through this part, um, just so that I can get some, to some of the animations at the end. For the planets that we did, for the stars that we didn't detect planets around, we had to be able to say at what limit do we not detect planets. Because we're going to do a survey, and we want to be able to count the planets around the stars that we saw, but we want to be able to say that star we don't think it had a planet down to some limit, and we can do a, we can do a, pop, a proper accounting of that. And these plots here show that for our very well observed stars, we can set very tight limits on the, the types of planets that we detect. The more poorly observed stars, we can set forward limits. If we put all these detections of planets together with our non-detections, we get a plot um, that looks like this. This is research that was published um, last fall in the Journal of Science. And the green dots correspond to the detected planets from our system, uh, from our program. And these are planets like the, the ones that have radio velocity curves that I showed you a few minutes ago. And this plot is Rate, uh, orbital period is on the horizontal axis. That's, it's uh, pretty similar to orbital distance. So you know, the Earth is 365 days, which is at 1 AU, so that's about right here. We're mostly looking at these close-in planets inside about um, a 50-day orbit. So this is interior even to Mercury's orbit. And on the vertical axis of this plot is the, um, the mass of these planets. So again, most of the planets that we're finding are bigger than the Earth. The Earth would be right down here. So the planets that we're finding are both closer in and more massive than, uh, than the Earth. And we can do a counting exercise. Let's draw some equally sized boxes. This is where Jupiter would be if it was very close into the Sun. And if we count the number of detected planets in this box, we find two planets there. Find another two planets uh, there two planets in this range which is not occupied in the solar system, um, a total of eight planets including candidates, Oops, and uh, this is the one that has eight. So we see this rising tide of more and more planets the small, uh, as we go down to lower and lower masses. So this is telling us a story. And the story is that as, we, as you go from very large planets and uh, down to smaller planets, we see more and more of them. So most stars that have planets, those planets are of low mass, typically three to ten times the mass of the Earth. Um, there's sort of, in our professional circles, there's this, a hot topic, which is what is the occurrence rate, that is how common are small planets, and these are planets typically the size of what we call super-Earths in this region here, up to the size of Neptunes. And we made a measurement this is about 15% of stars. You could imagine extrapolating this measurement of the rising tide of planets to one Earth mass planet. We can't actually measure so far a one Earth mass planet around a star like the Sun. But using this trend, we could extrapolate what we would expect it to be. And if we extrapolate, we find that, that it should be that one in four stars, about 25%, of sun-like stars have a close-in planet that's about the mass of the Earth. So that's a surprisingly large number, um, especially given these theoretical plots that expect a few small planets. Yeah. So when you're talking about the mass, we're talking a wobble method without 
confirmation by transit. That's just the minimum mass, right? So that's correct. When you say 25% of have like one mass, is that 25% have one mass minimum, and what would that go up to? So the question was on the the fact that our our tr our Doppler method doesn't actually measure the mass; it measures something called m sine i, which is the minimum mass. So on average, the the real mass. Um, that we measure is boosted by about 25%. Oh, okay. And a, a few of them are boosted by a larger factor, but on average it's not too big. So for these these rather large bins of mass, it doesn't make a big difference. Okay. Good question. Other questions? So um, the plot that's now on the screen is sort of the, is the public take-home plot of the previous professional one that I had just shown. And when this paper came out, it was... Um, it was a big deal, and the uh, NASA press office decided that they wanted to make some really nice graphics for it. And working with the graphic artists for this provided a lot of really interesting lessons about how to communicate our science to the public, and also highlighted some of our current research directions. So let me explain. Um, this, is, this again shows that uh, large planets orbiting close in are relatively rare, but as you go to smaller planets, they get bigger. I think it's more and more common. So the, the early versions of this plot um, had what we call these the so-called super-Earths right here. Um, they had just they had taken the Earth and just enlarged it, because that's right, it's a super-Earth. And we, um, being conservative scientists, said, no, 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 we don't actually know what these things are. They might not be Earths. They might be um, water worlds, um, you know, just a perpetual ocean that's uh, hundreds of kilometers deep. Um, they might have very thick atmospheres, so they're not at all like the Earth. We don't actually know what they are. So we said to the graphic artist, can you go back and just make them as mysterious as possible? We don't care how you do it. So they made them very heterogeneous and green. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the other interesting lesson is that we wanted to express our uncertainty with this extrapolation. I think it's probably right, so maybe within a factor of two, that Earths are, are pretty common. But I, you know, we didn't actually measure any Earths, so I wouldn't I wouldn't bet a huge amount of money on it. So their way of expressing uncertainty was to put a giant question mark <laughs> in the bin, which I think is completely appropriate. Um, OK, so I've now described these radio velocity measurements. Our key take-home message is that small planets, at least close in, are very common. And let's go back and revisit these theoretical predictions um, that we saw in about 10 slides into the talk. And again, this is our detected planets on the left. The green and the orange dots all refer to planets. And these blue dots here are the expected planets from these theoretical numerical simulations. And if we overlay the two, you can see just by eye, you don't need to do any sophisticated mathematical tests. They don't do very well. <laughs> Where we detect the most planets, right here, that's right in the middle of their planet desert. So there's no planets there. So the theorists are scratching their heads and going back to their blackboards and their computers to try to improve the, their simulations to, to match our measurements. So you don't know yet which of their assumptions are quite wrong? The question was on do we, what, what's wrong with their models? And we don't know. Um, there's a lot of suspects. <laughs> so now let me change topics a little bit and talk about transiting planets. I'm going to talk about the, this is all going to be public information about the Kepler um, mission. And Kepler was really a game changer both for exoplanets in general and especially for transiting exoplanets. During the, there was a press conference about a month ago when uh, NASA announced uh, 1,200 new planets from the Kepler mission. And they talked about a pre-Kepler era and a post-Kepler era. And I think that, that they're right. This is what the, a plot of the distribution of transiting planets was in, in 2009. And this is orbital period, similar to orbital distance, on the, uh, the horizontal axis. And this is size on the vertical axis. So most of the planets that were detected, there's about 100 of them, were similar to Jupiter with a smattering of smaller planets that people have gotten very excited about. As of June of last year, the Kepler mission announced this many planets. They completely changed our knowledge of both the distribution of planets 
uh, and the properties of individual planets. And then again, in February of, of um, this year, they announced this, these 1,200 planets. So this, again, this is a huge game changer. There probably won't be too many more plots like this where they, they flood the market with planets again. Um, Kepler, the, one of the interesting properties of this mission is that up for the close-in planets, the planets that are orbit close to their host star, you find them all right away. There's no sort of dribbling in of planets later on. The planets that the Kepler mission will find are going to be the really hard ones. And those planets are either going to have very long orbital periods, so they're going to be um, sort of out past the end of this plot, or they're going to be down here. They're going to be very small and very difficult to detect. Let me skip over that slide. So in my remaining time, I wanted to talk about three highlights from the Kepler mission. And these are specific planets, um, actually systems of planets that Kepler has detected that highlight um, new capabilities and also our new understandings of extrasolar uh, planets. This is the Kepler-10 system. You can see it looks like a wrecking ball that just came out of a furnace. And that's actually a, an apt analogy. The photometry, that is the brightness measurements as a function of time, produced by the Kepler mission are shown here. And this is a really extraordinary precision. For those of you who have your glasses on, you can see that here's one, so that's the nominal um, brightness of the star. And every once in a while, it goes down by half a, half a thousand. So Kepler, this um, transit right here stands out like a sore thumb, and it's a, um, a part in 2,000, the very impressive measurement. If we zoom in on this little region here, you can see that there's this fine little grid every um, less than a day the brightness of the star goes down very regularly. That's a transiting planet crossing across, crossing the disk of the star, causing it to be less bright. And also, superposed on that, on this sort of fine comb of transits that are uh, very quick, are a longer spaced uh, set of transits. Here's one that's deeper and also longer duration. And you can see if you zoom in on it, here's the longer transit and here's the short transit. Uh, of this very small planet. turns out this planet has a radius of only 1.4 times the size of the Earth. This is the smallest planet ever detected. Using the Keck telescope and exactly the Doppler technique I just described earlier, Jeff Marcy and many other people measured the mass of this planet and they found that it's about four and a half times the mass of the Earth. And if you put these two numbers together, you can make an extraordinary discovery, which is that 1.4 Earth radii and 4.5 and Earth masses means that the average density of this planet is about 9 grams per cubic centimeter. And for reference, the Earth is about 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. And the Earth is made mostly of rock with an iron nickel core. So this planet, just by just with these two very simple measurements, we know something about its composition. It has to be heavier than the Earth. And we think that it's a, a planet not unlike Mercury, that has a, a, a much thinner rocky exterior and a very uh, substantial iron core. So that's, I think, a powerful probe of the, uh, the, uh, the composition of these planets. What's the, what's the density of pure iron? I forget what it is. Mm -hmm. It's, um, well, there's an amazing thing. If you take a ball of iron and you keep making it bigger and bigger, the density actually goes up because you get compression in the middle. Um, I don't remember what the density of the uh, lump of iron is. At the center of Mercury, it's about 13 grams per cubic centimeter, but the bulk density is, is um, less than that. So this is a plot, a so-called mass radius 6 .98 plot. 6.98 grams per cubic centimeter. 6.98. Seven. The density is about 7 grams per cubic centimeter. <laughs> this planet is denser than that. Well, to say it another way, iron would float on this planet. <laughs> it would. <laughs> what does that mean its composition is? Well, we'll see a movie in a second of what uh, certain animals, 
So NASA animators think that this planet looks like. We don't. Um, it's a good question of what the composition actually is. It's some combination of iron, nickel, and silicate rocks, but the actual form, it's going to be very hot too, so the form is, um, is difficult. It's, it's not part of our common experience. Anyway, um, this is a, a so-called mass radius diagram, and this shows the compositions of different uh, planets that, we, that are known now. You see the solar system planets are labeled in this plot, but the thick white line here is Earth composition. So this is the silicate with an iron nickel core. Venus is very similar, it's an Earth cousin. And Mars has a is slightly lighter and therefore slightly off of this line. And Kepler 10b is to the right of the line, meaning that it's closer to the pure iron track. Interestingly, some of the other planets that have been discovered by the transiting method have um, densities that are, well, quite unlike ones that we see in the solar system. This planet, so-called uh, Gliese 1214b, has a, has a density that suggests that it's a, some hybrid of a water world, that is a world that has an ocean that's hundreds of kilometers thick, and a gas, uh, a gas planet like Neptune or Uranus. So it probably has a substantial gas atmosphere, then a very thick ocean, then a, um, a rocky and an iron core underneath that. So that's a, anyway, this, this is uh, sort of the new paradigm in extrasolar planets trying to figure out their composition. So now we will proceed with the video showing Kepler 10b. How far away are these planets? I mean, light years from Earth. The, um, the question was how far away are these planets? And the, there's two different answers depending on what part of the talk we're in. In the, <laughs> in the Doppler method, we look at one star at a time. So we want to look at the nearest and the brightest stars. And these stars are typically 20, 30, 50 light years away. Both the Kepler field, we want to look at 150,000 stars at a time. So you have to sort of take a step back and look at a big chunk of the sky at one time. And therefore, you're looking at very faint stars that are far away. And they're typically, typical distance is about 3,000 light years. So now, hold on to your seatbelt. I think there's a lot of speculation in this case. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you need to hold on your watch. <laughs> is so close to its host star that it's tidally locked to that star, just like our moon is tidally locked to the Earth. We always look at the same face of the moon, and um, this, the same face of this planet always faces the star. So the back side of this planet is expected to be quite cold, but the front side will be, you know, if you saw what it looks like, it's you know about 2,000 degrees and there's molten <coughs> rock and molten iron. Okay. Um, that was Kepler 10. We're also going to discuss Kepler 9 and Kepler 11. They're named in order, but I'm not presenting them in order. Kepler 9 is a really remarkable system that shows a new technique in this field called transit timing variations. And this, um, this is the so-called light curve. This is a measure of the brightness of the star as a function of time. So most of the time it's the same brightness, but then periodically you can see that there are these dips of the transit of the star, transit of the planet in front of the star. It doesn't look completely regular. It's a little bit irregular. And the first reason for that is that there's actually two planets orbiting this star. And these two planets, if you decompose them, you can see that they have their different respective transits. But what's really interesting is that the transits of these two planets are not perfect. They're not exactly like a clock. Sometimes they arrive a little bit early. Sometimes they arrive a little bit late. And this has to do with... Um, the gravitational interactions between the planets. So the planets, as they're orbiting the host star, they not only are tugging on the, the, the host star, they're tugging on each other. 
and they're sometimes um, therefore leading a little bit and sometimes lagging a little bit. So we get a huge amount of information from modeling how the planets lead and lag each other. And we can actually derive the, the masses, how much these planets weigh, just from figuring out how much they're gravitationally perturbing each other and modeling that in a very detailed way. So um, that new technique was used with great fanfare in the Kepler-11 system. This is, might be the most famous Kepler system announced to date. Uh, you can see in this plot that there are, this graphic, that there are six transiting planets. This is what the data looks like. This is a, um, a raw light curve that comes out of the telescope, and these jumps have to do with the fact that the Kepler telescope has to roll 90 degrees every quarter to keep its solar panels pointing at the sun. When it rolls, you have these discontinuities. These are other artifacts in the data. This gets very, uh, very well cleaned up. And you can see that there's just a forest of these transits of a planet passing in front of the star. And each of the dots down here label the respective planet as it passes in front of the star. This data can then be phased up to the orbital periods of these particular planets. And you can see that the six planets here, they all have their different characteristics. They're Durations are slightly different, having to do with how far away they are from the star and their relative speed as they pass in front of the disk of the star. Their depths also vary, so these planets have different physical sizes um, compared to each other and also compared to the disk of the star. From these different depth transits, we can determine the planet radii, how big they are. And from the gravitational interactions between each other, that is these transit timing variations, we can measure the masses of the planets, that is how heavy they are. So combining this two will get densities, and I'll show you that in a second. But first I want to show you when uh, yet another uh, animation. One thing that's remarkable about this system, so first of all the scale, this all takes place within about, the, uh, within about Mercury's orbit. And there's six planets that have um, each of which are several times the mass of the Earth. The system is so well aligned, actually, that its, um, its aspect ratio is comparable to a record. Okay. So now let's go back, from, back to a little bit of a technical plot from these PR videos. <laughs> this is the one that I'm really excited about. Um, we, we saw an earlier version of this plot and this shows on the left, this is planet mass, so how heavy the planet is. And on the vertical axis is the planet radius, so how large it is physically. And these, these dashed lines here show different compositions. So a planet made of pure ice is here, pure rock, pure iron. And what's interesting is that these are all of the known transiting planets that have very good <coughs> both masses and radii. See that there's this trend from objects that have a lot of gas in addition to their ice, going down to be more and more rocky and eventually have larger fractions of iron. The red points here are dominated by uh, the Kepler-11 system, which I just showed you. And on the right, this is, if we take the planet radius and the planet mass and combine them, you can see that as you go to smaller and smaller planets, the densities shoot up from for about one to two grams per cubic centimeter, this is comparable to Neptune, and it shoots up to be densities comparable to the Earth. So in the next couple of years, as this graph is filled in, we're going to learn a lot about what the compositions of these planets are, if they're typically ice worlds, rocky, iron, and even if they have atmospheres attached to them. So the final um, animation that I want to show you is one that sort of blew my mind. Uh, this this is an ancient uh, model of the solar system called an orrery, and you've probably seen these. It's a device that's got a hand crank and a bunch of gears and just the right ratios, so that as you turn the crank, the planets move around the, the host, the star, in this case our sun, at just the right rates. And the really fancy orreries have the Galilean moons and the, the Saturnian moons um, that also move around at the right speeds. Kepler. Um, now has its own orrery, except it has more than one star. <laughs> each one of these, each one of these sets of concentric circles, are the multi-transiting planets from Kepler. So 
So these are the ones where there's more than one planet per star. And each circle represents the orbit of a different planet. And the dots, of course, are the planets themselves. And if you set it in motion, <laughs> it's just a dizzying array. So, that's all that I had planned to talk about, and I'm happy to take your questions. Earlier, you said um, that most of them were just, not concentric. Just if you could wipe the, the uh, microphone with the with the questions, and we will get get around to you. We've got two mics, so we'll be one on each side, and we'll go back and forth. How did the project convince Congress to spend, what was it, $600 million on something that won't really help us here on Earth? It won't cure cancer, it won't do anything except satisfy our intellectual curiosity. Uh, I'm not sure, but I wish they'd spend more of it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> Thanks for coming out to South Bay. Uh, so I'd like to hear the definition of Earth-like from somebody who's looking for them, presumably yourself. It's a flexible definition. Um, <laughs> I guess I would call Earth-like for me, composition is the most interesting aspect. So for me, Earth-like is a planet that's a mostly rocky planet, and an especially Earth-like planet maybe has oceans and a thin veneer of an atmosphere like our own Earth does. Some people also apply, uh, they want the planet to be at the same orbital distance as our Earth is. We're seeing, we're going to be sensitive to those planets in the coming years, but so far we haven't detected them, so all of the Earth-like planets that we talk about are tend to be close into their stars. So, so I'm going to ask a little bit of a question. By the way, let me, let me answer a question you didn't ask as well. Um, <laughs> the question I often get in these talks is, um, what's the difference between a planet and a brown dwarf? A brown dwarf um, is a, an object that's that one definition is that it's bigger than 13 times the mass of the Earth, or time, times the mass of Jupiter, because when it's that large, it can start to um, have nuclear fusion at its core. I actually don't agree with that definition. I think that a better definition is that a planet is something that forms by the processes that I showed pictures of, that is, the processes by which you make all these small objects that we easily identify as planets, and brown dwarfs are made by some other process. So is there any, um, two questions, sir. is there any things on the horizon even more spectacular about plants that are coming about, and where do you think we'll be 10 years from now? The Kepler mission is going to really change the landscape. It's already started to do that. The trajectory for the Kepler mission is that it nominally has a three and a half year on sky lifetime, and it's been up there for about two years now. Kepler might be extended, I hope it is. Um, the Earth's, and I'm not, not making any promises here, but the, the time when you could expect an Earth to come out of the Kepler mission would be that uh, you, 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 know, you point the telescope at these stars, you see a very small dip, and you get excited about it. A year later, it repeats, again, using the, the 1AU analogy for, for the Earth. Now you have a prediction. You know how what the expected orbital period is. Another year later, you look and you see, did it... Was there a dip there? If that produces a dip, then you have a very you have a good candidate for a potential Earth. So if Kepler's going to announce Earths, and I don't I don't have not presenting the inside knowledge here, that's the time scale. So it's you know a couple years from now. On a longer time scale, um, the direction that that folks are moving in, and the community is moving in, is to try to take pictures to solve the first problem I described, to take pictures of these planets that are relatively close into their host stars. And that involves some really sophisticated optics and um, efforts to suppress the starlight itself so you can look in the region very near to the star. So the two goals are to take pictures of Earth-like planets and also to take their spectra, which is an even harder step. So now you not only have to, take a, to figure out that there's a little point of light there that corresponds to a planet the size of the Earth, you have to spread the light out into its spectrum and see if you can figure anything out from that spectrum. Um, what are the chemical composition of the atmosphere, for example? Next question over here. Uh, do these me measurements allow you to say anything about the plane that, of the planetary systems 
at the orientation of the plane? Um, and if so, how are those distributed in the systems that you've looked at? The Kepler mission is only sensitive to planets whose orbital planes happen to be right along our line of sight. The Doppler method is sensitive to all orientations. Um, as best we can tell, they're completely randomly oriented. That's what we would. That's what you'd expect because the the seeds of these planetary systems are these molecular clouds of gas and dust, and that they're more or less randomly distributed all over the Milky Way galaxy, and that, and that they won't have any particular orientation when they collapse to form stars and planets. We don't have any reason to think otherwise. <coughs> It, it seems to me, as if I understand this, is that these these planets more or less pop out of complex mathematical treatment. So how reliable is that treatment? Might there be duplet or, or, or many solutions for one set of data? Might there be... What sort of error limits are there on all of this? It seems to me that it, there's a lot of mathematics involved, and it's just not clear just how, how solid all of these conclusions might be. Well, there's two important checks on the, on the math that I can think of. One is that there's a lot, a lot of very competitive people involved who would love to prove each other wrong. <laughs> and that hasn't really happened. The other check is that many of the planets, I should say a handful of the planets that were discovered by the radio velocity technique, were subsequently shown to transit their host star. And you can verify that the same properties derived from the first technique are they're verified. So that's a good check. Next question. Uh, Kepler, Kepler 11, um, you said that they were very close uh, within the same orbit. Okay. Um, and just to what we know, the moon is moving away from us. Are these uh, planets moving towards each other? They or are. Should they be? So there, there's a couple interesting questions embedded in, in what you asked. And one is, what is the long-term motion of this system? And it's thought that these planets probably formed much farther away from their host star. And then they've all sort of marched in together, getting closer and closer, and that we're seeing them in a snapshot, that maybe they've, they've got to a sort of a parking position. Um, but these planets definitely, uh, they kick each other around, but they, they seem to be in a stable configuration over billions of years. Do you think that's what happened to us? Um, you know, that the moon, there was a planet close enough? Well, so the moon was, it was the idea of the moon's formation is that a, a second small planet in our own solar system, the very early history of our solar system, collided with the proto-Earth. And this collision was so violent that it ripped off much of the outer shell of the Earth, and that that shell um, coalesced to form the moon. So was it, was that planet sitting very close to Earth? It was, it, it, it crossed out the orbit of the Earth. Much like the Kepler-11 set. Well, th those are, there's, the Kepler-11 is sort of a safe system. You know, if we go back in 100 million years, it'll still look the same, I think. Okay. You alluded to that in the previous question. We're finding planets in places where they couldn't have formed, like these Jupiters hot next to their planets. Uh, to the suns. What is our current status in the field of like planet migrations and, and the, how do the models that we have fit some of the observed data? Mm -hmm. This is actually a huge question um, right now. So the, to summarize the question, Jupiters are expected to form where our Jupiter formed, basically, out past the ice line where you have a lot of there's a higher density of solids and also ices that can come together and form the seed for a gas planet that grows very, to a large size. The explanation that everyone accepted for a long time was that these planets migrated in the first five million years through interactions with the gas that was left over from planet formation. And this, in this disk of material, the planets moved in very close to their own star. So this theory would make makes a bunch of predictions. One of the predictions is that you would expect if planets move in this, this gas disk, that they would be aligned to the, the spin axis of the star. So if the star is like a top and it's spinning you know, around my finger, you would expect that the planet would orbit like this. There's a 
technique called the Rossiter-McLaughlin technique that allows us to measure whether or not planets are orbiting in the same plane as their star rotates. And we find that some of these planets go like this. <laughs> and some of them go the wrong way. So that theory can't be right. That can't be completely right. And we don't yet have a viable alternative. So there's a few options on the table to replace it. One is that planets farther out had gravitational scatterings with each other, and that these scatterings cause one of the planets to be kicked in to the, to the inner solar system, the, the other planet to be kicked out. And when it gets kicked in, then the tides from the host star circularize and shrink the orbit to what we see today. So that's one alternative, but it, it's, had, it's got a few problems, too. <laughs> How far has coronography developed to assist you in your planet finding? So coronography is this technique of, another name for it is high contrast imaging. It's trying to take a picture of a lit match next to a lighthouse. And the coronagraph is, um, from which this word coronography is derived, is basically a technique of taking an opaque disk and putting it over the bright thing and then looking for the very dim things nearby. It's like putting your thumb up in the sky to cover the sun and looking for something in the halo of the sun. Um, this technique has really blossomed in the last decade, and I think it's in a position where they might get some good pictures of planets in the next, say, three to four years. There's two new instruments that will go on big telescopes uh, around the world. One is called GPI. It's actually being developed at the University of California. And the other is called SPHERE. And these two instruments will probably allow us to detect young Jupiter-sized planets. So when the planets are very young, they still have a lot of their heat from formation, so they glow very brightly, which makes them more easily seen. And also larger planets are easier to see. So these genera next generation instruments will be able to see those kinds of planets. There's a hope in the community that in maybe a decade or two decades, we'll have a big flagship space mission, which will have coronography as its central component, and we can try to take pictures of much smaller and cooler planets, including Earth-like planets. Any possibility of uh, spectroscopy with a, say, 10x uh, Super Jupiter uh, and, and Kepler, if there's something like that? As it, as it crosses the limb of the star. Um, the... Let's see, so the, there's a couple problems. One is that the Kepler stars are very far away because you want to look at so many of them at the same time. The average star is, is very faint. And to be quantitative, it's typically its 15th magnitude. So it's 10,000 times fainter than the faintest star that you can see with your eyes. And this makes it much harder to follow up with, say, the Hubble Space Telescope or the Spitzer Space Telescope. Having said that, there are groups that are sort of cherry-picking the best the brightest stars and the biggest planets and trying to do um, to measure the atmospheric constituents of the planets as the planet passes in front of its host star. So we'll have it for a handful of, of what will be some well-known cases, but most will not. Other questions? I, I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what do you think the implications of planet discoveries are for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence? Because you, uh, you got is, your this PhD has been the arc of my, so. This has been the arc of my career so far. Um, <laughs> many of you know that the Drake equation is uh, right behind me. I can, so the Drake equation predicts the number of transmitting civilizations out there. And it, it basically, you multiply a bunch of numbers together, which each of which corresponds to something going right. That is, the first one is the, pro the fraction of stars that have planets and the fraction that have Earths, so forth and so on, until you get meet all of the qualifications for finding life. One of the terms in this equation is the fraction of planets that are Earth-like. And we're finding that from the radio velocity surveys and from Kepler, that small planets are much more common than big planets. So if you evaluate the Drake equation today and compare it to what you would have thought maybe 10 years ago, I bet you get a bigger number because there's a lot more small planets. 
Any other questions? Here's one here. Is it Andrew? I have a question too. But your your comment on the small planets was not you haven't seen those. You're just projecting that number, right? We have. So there's two answers for the radio velocity techniques. We've only gotten down to three times the, the size of the Earth, the mass of the Earth, actually. And so that's an extrapolation that I, to expect that one Earth mass planets are also common. But I'd be pretty surprised if the plot I showed suddenly, you know, was going up and up, and then suddenly it just plummeted down to zero. For Kepler, we're actually seeing one Earth radius planets. So we're seeing that they are also common as well. Andrew, I just have a quick question. So uh, with the field of view of Kepler, um, is it uh, sampling uh, stars that are uh, a certain radius away from the middle of our galaxy? What's, what are, are we perhaps being biased by a particular spot that Kepler's looking at in what Kepler's going to be t able to tell us about exoplanets because of its field of view? Um, I'm not sure if the orientation is looking away from the galactic center or is it moving towards the galactic center. So we're looking kind of, we're looking along one of the spiral arms. And if you go outside on a really clear night and you look up and see the Milky Way, there's sort of a, a central band where it's, the Milky Way is brightest. And we're looking just off of that, so sort of skimming off one of the spiral arms. And the reason that that was chosen is they wanted the density of stars to be really high, that is, you want to sample as many stars as possible, but not so high that they're on top of each other. So we looked within the Milky Way in the plane, but not right in the middle. So it's meant to be an average part of that flight, part of the galaxy. Yeah. And there's 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 an idea that the as our galaxy rotates on a time scale of 100 million years or so, that there's mixing of the stars. So the stars that are in our neighborhood now are not going to be in our neighborhood in 100 million years, and they'll be shuffled around. So if we're looking at stars over there, they should be pretty similar <coughs> to the stars that are in our solar neighborhood. On the uh, what percentage of the stars do we now think have no planets? <laughs> <laughs> so the question was what percentage of the stars have no planets? Uh, it's a hard question to answer because you have to say what the limit is. That is, a, you know, where are you, where are you going to draw the line? For the, um, the Doppler survey that I talked about, the first part, we found that 15% of stars have at least one planet down to a mass of three times the mass of the Earth and out to an orbital period of 50 days. So these are the close-in planets. So that means that 85% don't have that kind of planet. It's hard to say with certainty what fraction don't have any planets, though. Yeah. Do you think it's two or fifty or So what? Uh, this is a little bit of conjecture, but our um, our understanding of how stars form is that you always get this disk of material along the midplane, and it's always going to have dust and gas. So to not have any planets form, form there means that something goes a little bit differently. Maybe the planets form and they're lost to the host star because they migrate in and go into the star. It would be, it seems like an unusual situation where there'd be no planets. Do we have time for two more questions? There's one here and then I think I saw one hand over that one. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a question sort of related to the issue of stars that do not have planets. Um, the sun has a rotational period of a little less than a month. Um, we believe that planets form around stars with rotational periods on the order of a few weeks, but some stars have a rotational period of a few hours or even a few days. Um, do we have data on the rotational period of stars in the Kepler field? Because we're measuring the, the um, all these stars in the Kepler field very precisely. One thing that you can do is measure the rotation period for most of them pretty well, because spots on the surface of the star will cross the disk of the star, go and repeat on the rotation period of the star. The other thing to say about rotation periods is that most stars start out spinning very fast, typically a few days, 
And as they age, their rotation periods slow down as the solar wind carries away um, the angular momentum of the star. <coughs> so if you measure a star's rotation period, it's a pretty good estimate of the age of the star. One last. Uh, some systems are in resonance and some systems are in close resonance. Does that, uh, the resonance, does that actually uh, increase the stability of the systems or does it actually decrease the stability of the system? So this was a question about so-called orbital resonances. And an orbital resonance is when you have more than one planet orbiting the same star. And if the orbital periods are integer multiples of each other, mm -hmm. say 10 days and 20 days, you'll have the the interactions between the planets will be even stronger. And what the folks working with these data in detail find is that most of the planets that are near residence are not exactly in residence, which is to say that if one orbital period is 10.0 days, the other one might be 19.9 days. So they're, they're, they're close, but not exactly in it. And there are reasons to expect that this would lead to an increase in the stability of the system. That is, and by stability, I mean that the planet Planets would last for billions of years and that they wouldn't eject from the system. Yeah. Okay, I, uh, we're going to stop the questions there, but I'd encourage you to come up and speak to, the, to Andrew uh, now after his talk. And Andrew is a memento of your uh, great talk here. Thank you. It's an <laughs> antique SETI mug. <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in thanking you.